Hi everybody, my name is Bob Cruz. I am so excited to be presenting today and first and foremost, I hope this finds you all safe and well during these very chaotic, crazy times. But hey, so very happy that you were able to join us at Virtual Community Days and for my session, one thing I wanna emphasize, make sure you're aware of is in order to minimize glitches and screw ups, which hey, I do every once in a while, uh, this session is pre-recorded None the same, I'm gonna to try to make it feel live and interactive, so if I tell a bad joke, go ahead and do an LOL or ha ha, I'd appreciate it. And the other thing that I wanna emphasize is that the Q&A after the session will be live, so you can submit your questions via Slido. Looking forward to that, looking forward to chatting with you after you listen to this session. So again, thank you so much for joining me today for this session, and I'm just gonna share my screen here real quick. Bada boom, bada bing, there you go. So today's session is rapid risk analysis in an agile and DevOps world. Now, think about it. I've been in IT for a long time. And I started off back in the COBOL days with CICS where all we truly had to worry about were green screens and fields and things along that line. Whereas now, all of the conditions, the different scenarios that we need to validate have increased significantly. But you know, it's not just the technology which has introduced all of these additional conditions and scenarios. The other factors are the different methodology, agile DevOps being one of them, because that has introduced speed. We have got to get our applications into production faster than ever before. So that introduces some consideration that we have to take into account. The other thing also, our users are so much more astute. If there's a defect in our application, I guarantee you that you're gonna find it. So that has all made risk analysis so much more important. But the thing is, risk analysis, because of Agile and DevOps, it needs to be done very, very quickly. So I am going to share with you a rapid risk approach to risk analysis to help improve testing. So again, my name is Bob Cruz. I am very excited to be the CEO and co-founder of Checkpoint Technologies. We specialize in quality assurance and software testing. I am also the president of the Tampa Bay Quality Assurance Association, and I've been on the board of directors with Vivid, who I'm happy to say has teamed up with Unicom to bring us virtual community days and I'm the co-leader of the Vivid chapter here in Florida. And I've been in IT now for 31 years. So what we're gonna talk about, we are gonna focus on why you can't possibly test everything. You just can't do it. But you know, isn't it great if you're able to go to your leadership and say, you know, I wasn't able to test everything, but I was at least able to test the riskiest functionality, and those that are gonna have the greatest impact and or the probability for failure. So we're gonna talk about why you can't test everything. We'll discuss the value of performing risk analysis and how to improve your testing with risk analysis, specifically a rapid risk scoring approach that I'm gonna share with you. So you cannot test a program completely just can't be done you will find that quote in the testing computer software book authored by Kem Kaner Jack Falk and Hung Wen and the reasons that they cite primarily three reasons that complete testing is impossible one is that the domain of possible inputs is too large to test I was a lead on an FBI project, NCIS 2000, and one of the areas I was responsible for were VIN edits, vehicle identification number. As you can imagine with a VIN, which is up to a 14 character code, and those are positional, alphanumeric, so a negative testing, so a valid VIN versus an invalid VIN, it's just astronomical, all of the different conditions you could possibly validate. There's also way too many possible paths 
through a program to test. As our programs become so much more complicated and complex, the number of different paths increase significantly. And then user interface issues are too complex and they're becoming more and more complex every day. So back in the days of CICS green screens, think about it, all you had were fields and screens that you would navigate to. You didn't even use a mouse. Now we've gotten to the point where many of our mobile phones utilize face recognition. So they utilize the eyes. I have no doubt that very soon you'll be seeing our phones able to understand and comprehend facial expressions and that will give them specific in instructions. I mean, we've got drag, drops, expand, slides. So a lot of different scenarios in the user interface alone. And it's interesting because when you ask a lot of testers about what is their ultimate goal, they will tell you that they're trying quite often to get rid of all defects. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful if we could guarantee that our applications are defect free? But there is a cost to testing. As you test more, our testing costs go up and we are trying to make sure that we minimize all of our different failure costs. So those costs associated to defects being found in production, our website being unavailable or crashing, or some of the many different security issues that we deal with and are becoming more and more prevalent. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, there were very few e-commerce websites. Now, you just find a plethora of those just all over the place. So again, these can be high impact and high likelihood for failure, but the thing you need to make sure is that you hit that optimal point for testing, where your cost of testing does not start surpassing the possible failure cost. Warren Buffett, one of my idols, has a quote that says, risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. So that's where risk analysis can help significantly. It helps you develop a plan, a strategy. So some important terminology I wanna be sure to share with you in regard to risk analysis. So if I use the term asset, we can be talking about any type of a component, the data, a requirement, a use case, a user story. You can actually apply risk analysis to any and all of these. I'm going to be focusing on requirements, and in this case, please bear with me, I'm going to have that be synonymous with the use case or user stories. So, but when we talk about asset, remember, risk analysis can be applied to any of these. And then there's impact or criticality. So there we're talking about what kind of an impact is this going to cause to our organization? Remember, it's a business, we have to think that way. As testers, as quality assurance experts, we cannot forget the fact that there is a business depending upon us, and that business is expected to be profitable, maintain customers, maintain customer satisfaction, and beat the competition. So when we talk about impact though, it's not just about money, and sometimes that monetary loss that I'm talking about can be direct or indirect because we might be talking about reputation. We all know what a negative reputation can do to any organization. We could be talking about a breach of law or a contract or regulation. So this is what I mean when I use the term impact or criticality. Then there's probability or likelihood. So what is the probability that a given event will be triggered? I'll be sharing with you at a certain point a lot of different factors that can impact not, or I should say influence, not only impact, but also likelihood or probability. And then there's exposure. So think about this for a moment. If you identify a transaction or certain functionality that when it fails, it could cost the organization 
$10,000. But in all likelihood, it would only fail perhaps once in any given year. But then you identify another transaction that when it fails might cost the company $100. But you determine that the exposure, the frequency of that failure could end up occurring 20,000 times. So as you can see, that would make a difference. There's also, who is it impacting? Because in the world of business, we all know that certain clients, certain customers, have more importance than others, sad but true. So if I'm an investing organization, then the exposure to my $10 million clients is probably going to be more important to me than the exposure to my $1,000 clients. So remember, asset, impact or criticality, likelihood or probability, and exposure. These are things that you have to take into account. So now let me share with you a risk-based testing approach. So the idea here is that risks are implied by your assets failing. So remember, an asset might be a component in the code, functionality, a requirement, a use case, a user story. So the idea here is we want to perform risk analysis against whatever assets we identify. For most of this presentation, as I mentioned, I'm gonna be focused on requirements or i.e. user stories and use cases. For each of these assets, I would assign a risk score based upon impact and probability. So the idea is for each asset, we're gonna ask, what is the business impact if this fails? And we're going to ask, what is the prob probability, the likelihood of this failing? Now, by doing risk analysis, the benefits are enormous. It allows us to run tests in risk order. So we're going to start with our high impact, high probability, and we're going to execute last our low impact, low probability we will be able to allocate the test effort based on risk. It allows our organization to make much smarter release decisions. We can determine, okay, are we going to reschedule or postpone our release, or is our risk greater if we don't release it? So it helps us to make that type of a decision. If the schedule requires, we can drop our test in risk order. So in other words, if we've got 5,000 test cases that we have to execute, and we know that the lowest 1,000 are low impact, low probability, then we may decide, you know what? We will execute those if time permits. So the value of these benefits is by running tests in risk order, it allows us to find the scary stuff first. So show of hands, how many of you have been a developer or are a developer? So I've been a developer for many, many years in my career. And it was fantastic when somebody would come to me and give me the luxury of the added time to resolve a high impact, high probability issue it gave me more time to fix the scary stuff, if you will. We can pick the right test by allocating the test effort based on risk. So another way to look at it is, I'm going to probably put my most experienced testers, the most qualified QA experts, on the high impact, high probability test, or functionality, if you will so that they can resolve those and execute those first. And then perhaps concurrently, I might have my less experienced, more junior tester executing and validating the low impact, low probability test. And then allowing organizations to make smarter release decisions. Well there, as I mentioned, we can release when the risk of delay balances 
the risk of dissatisfaction. Because we all know that when we postpone our release schedule, the stakeholders, the customers could end up being very unhappy. So by performing risk analysis and knowing what the high impact, high probability are, we can make a better decision and balance our concerns. And remember, as I mentioned, we can give up tests, you worry about the least. So the low impact, low probability, if we just no way have the time to execute all of our tests, we can drop those tests. So the process is, you wanna formal, formalize the process. That's the process. So the first thing you wanna do is create a risk profile. And this is an ongoing effort. You're gonna define numeric ratings with detailed descriptions, the more granularity, the better, and develop an assessment questionnaire. So this will help the testers who might not be business experts perform risk analysis. You assign risk scores to granular assets, and we're gonna focus on that in just a moment. You compile that risk assessment database, and that helps ongoing continuous improvement, and you revise that risk profile as appropriate. So as I mentioned, we're going to focus on assigning risk scores to the granular assets. So when you're assigning the risk scores, first thing you want to do is assemb assemble your list of assets. So they might be requirements, they might be tests. You then, for each asset, determine the impact if that risk occurs. For each asset, determine the probability, the likelihood that that risk will occur. And then you calculate the risk score. So you use a combination of the impact and the probability and perhaps weight. So there are certain factors that you might give a weight to because you know it significantly influences the impact or the probability. So with risk analysis, remember, we're talking about impact. Is it a loss of life, loss of revenue, inconvenience, the exposure, the frequency? Who's impacted by this? And there's probability. Is it new functionality or new technology? If it is, then you have to bump up the probability at least a little bit. So if it's not mature, mature stable functionality that you've tested before, you've got to increase the probability. The weight, are there any additional factors? And you don't have to use a weight, but you wanna ask, are there any other factors that we need to consider and factor into the calculation to more adequately determine the final risk score? So I mentioned I was gonna share with you some factors which could influence either impact or likelihood. So ask yourself, determine, is the code complex? If so, that's going to influence the probability. It will end up being higher. Is it new? And I'm not going to read this whole list to you, but take a look at this partial list written by William Perry of Quality Assurance Institute fame. Um, so again, these are all very important factors that you have to look at that could influence probability, impact, or perhaps even both, such as is it popular functionality and utilized a great deal. Now, you've got some different options for the computation. So you can add the criteria scores, you can multiply them together, or my favorite, which I'm gonna show in a moment, is score plotting. So the idea is you're gonna use the multiplication effort, but then you're gonna average the scores out and plot them in different quadrants. So the plotting procedures, there are three steps to that. One is determine the impact, you then calculate the probability score, and each score you plot the X and the Y on a risk analysis chart, which has four different quadrants. So quadrant four is where you would start your testing, and that is the high impact, high probability functionality. 
And then there's quadrant two, which focuses on the high impact, low probability, right on down to quadrant one, where we have the low impact, low probability. If you've got a large enough team where you can divide the team up into these different quadrants, fantastic. But if you've got an aggressive target date and a smaller team, then perhaps what you might want to do is tackle these sequentially, going with quadrant four, three, two, and then one. So one thing to think about is when would a risk be considered acceptable? The other question you want to ask yourself is besides risk, what other factors might influence priority? So one thing is the stakeholder, the schedule, if the boss, if leadership says it's a high priority, even though the risk score doesn't bear that out, then it's a high priority. Because remember, risk may not always dictate priority and vice versa. A lot of different things can influence it. And the other thing to ask yourself is, is the risk acceptable? So if it's a low impact with some easy workarounds, and it would cost the organization significantly more to resolve the issue than to leave it in there, then you know what? The decision may be that risk is acceptable. So to see an example, now first I'm going to show you an example of a more complex, robust risk scoring approach. This would take time. If you're going to implement this, I'd recommend that you start off with brand new projects and or smaller and build this process into your testing strategy over time. So first thing you want to do is come up with scores for impact. So here you'll notice we have 11 different ratings, zero through 10. I'll let you read them, but you can see zero is no impact at all, all the way to 10, where that indicates major impact, major loss, no workarounds available, the customers notice, company-wide processing is halted. As you can imagine, that would be significant to an organization. So you'll notice these descriptions, these definitions are very granular, easy to understand, and very clear. So we've got our database, we've got our criteria for impact. Then we want to determine the probability or likelihood, the scores for that. So we've identified, in my example here, three factors which tend to influence in our organization, in my make-believe organization here, these are the factors that influence the probability the most. Complexity of the code, and notice I've given it a weight of three. Frequency of use, given it a weight of two. And new functionality with a weight of one. And then we would rate each component by a five, a three, or a one. Basically low means, you know, there's really no weight, but we're giving it a one just to make sure it's clear we've thought of everything. So then down at the bottom, you will see the calculation for probability. So we're going to take complexity, whatever we rate that, a five, a three, or a one, and multiply that by three, the weight. Frequency of use, we multiply by two. And new functionality by one, so as is, we then divide it by three to get our probability of failure. So here's our example, where imagine we've got a retail store, we've got three different modules, select items in our shopping cart application, credit card payment in the payment process application, and then we've got shipping query in our order queries application. So you can see there the different ratings we've given each one. And then you'll notice the weight right above in the row where it says weight of risk. So then underneath probability score in weight of risk, we show the calculation we're using. And then we calculate out to show the different scores we've given it for probability. And then in the next column, we've got impact score. So with impact score, you see that select items has a seven, credit card payment has a 10. 
So highest impact. If we can't accept credit card payments, we've got a real problem. And then shipping query has four. And then we would take these, plot these in our quadrants. Now imagine, if you will, if we had 1,000 test cases and a software solution that does this, and there are many, then it gives us a fantastic visual representation and we can have our team and say, okay, uh, Joe and Tanya, you take quadrant four. You're our experts. You're our most experienced team members. And then allocate work in that manner. So again, this is the more complex, time-consuming method. What I want to share with you is a rapid risk scoring approach. And there what we do is we get a team or designated group together. Each individual gets a card. So think of agile poker, if you will. And perhaps, you know, we use scores of one through four. We can go more granular if we want. Describe the entity. So somebody needs to be a moderator and they should describe the entity with similar strategies with the same type of description for each. So very factual and neutral. The moderator does not want to try to influence the team and share information such as whether or not it's new functionality, whether or not there's a history of failures, things along that line. You give each person five seconds to hold up the scorecard. So one, two, three, four, five. And then they would put up the score first doing impact and then probability. But you average the scores each time from the team and you compute the risk score. One of the, th if you find that your team is way off and most of them don't agree, you know what, that is a great opportunity for discussion because perhaps some folks need to be educated on the functionality and or some folks have information that the rest of the team is not aware of. And then once you do that, you would plot it. So in this example where when I do real live classes, an exercise that we do is we go over three different transactions. So a login process, you can see the information that I would share with them. And then we do the one, two, three, four, five, and the group will hold up a rating. So then there's a product search, same type of thing. We would give everybody a few seconds, and then the class would end up holding up a score. We do the same thing for an order checkout, and then a product return. And you know what's absolutely amazing? In all the times I've provided this class, I've actually had where 95% of the class consistently will give it an impact of four and then a probability of two or three for the login process. And then for the product search, 90% of the class will give it an impact of three and then for probability, a three or four. Order checkout, 95%, 95% will agree that order checkout is an impact of four with a probability of four. Because notice that it has mature functionality, but there has been a history of failures. And then there's product return. 90% will give it an impact of a one or two, which is relatively low. So one is low, two is medium. And then a probability of a one or two. So you can see there is wisdom in the crowd, wisdom of the crowd, where when you get a large group of people, now this is assuming, by the way, that you've got an experienced team that understand the business. They don't have to be experts. But this also gives them an opportunity that if they honestly say they don't have enough knowledge to be able to contribute a score, then you know what, perhaps what you do is you get an end user a business user, a stakeholder in to educate the team on how it is used, how that functionality is used, and what is expected in the real world. So, hey, I hope you found this beneficial. We're going to have questions. This just gives you some information about Checkpoint Technologies. As I mentioned, we focus on quality assurance and software testing, incorporated in 2003. And we are partners with MicroFocus. We have a lot of Atlassian expertise. And we're also proud to be partners with Tricentis, 
Cobaton Mobile Labs as well, and QAI. And hey, before I forget, you've got to be sure to hang around all week. I'm so psyched that this is the first day of the conference. And then right after my session, if you have not ever heard Jonathan White speak, I'm telling you, not only is he a world-renowned expert in so many areas, but he is an excellent speaker, excellent speaker. So hang around and check out his State of Tooling keynote. Thank you so very much. And now we are going to dive right into questions and answers. But before I do that, one other thing. Hey, go talk to the vendors and the sponsors that have helped put this on. Believe me, they are world experts in IT. So pick their brains. Don't view them just as salespeople, okay? They're consultants. They're experts in their field. Go chat with them. And while you're there, say, hey, thanks for sponsoring uh, VCD. So now on to some Q&A. We're going to do that live. And uh, please contact me with any questions, any thoughts. Love hearing from you. Take care. Talk to you in just a little bit during the Q&A. Bye now.